Thank you. Thank you guys for sticking around for, well, come and watch me stand up here and talk and try not to make a fool of myself. So appreciate you guys coming. So I'm um, Dan from Stan Release Aids. Uh, we're based out of Auburn, New York. Um, we've been making release aids for, well, Eric's been making release aids since about 2001, but Stan Zlosky has been in business since uh, 1970. So um, I'm going to show you a little video here. Um, so this is Eric. He was going to be here, but we had a new machine come in. So he had to be back at the factory to get the machine set up so he couldn't be here. But this is a, a little video of Eric telling the whole story of how Stan started in the beginning. The history of Stanislavski release aids, uh, you know, it's now Stan release aids, was um, in 1969, he and some others worked out this hinge release concept and started making them. In 1970, he started Stanislavski Archie products and he made it official. He started manufacturing them. He made all kinds of hinges, um, had some cast, moved into some CNC machined items, and, and so on. And he, uh, you know, he started, he, was, he had a little bit of success, but it really began to take off when he was the guy who shot the first 300 in Vegas. You know, that was uh, that was a big deal back then. He was the, he didn't shoot a 900, but he was the first person to shoot a clean 300. Um, and that got other people involved. Uh, more people were trying it out. You know, what what's behind this back tension thing? And of course, it's that whole concept and that release led to a revolution of you know how we shoot a boat and led to what we're doing today. So that's how Stan releases got started. Mel had a great idea and got some people behind him and came up with a hinge release and uh, kind of took it from there. And then him and Jerry Carter from Carter Enterprises kind of went back and forth. They initially had an agreement that Stan was just going to make hinges and Jerry was going to make buttons. And then Jerry made a hinge and then Mel made a button. So it just it turned into sort of really good, healthy competition between the two companies and um, kind of revolutionized the archery release a game between those two gentlemen. So. Um, said founded 1970 by by mel um eric and doug are brothers they purchased it from um mel in 2001 they moved it from out on the west coast back to new york so we're based out of auburn new york and been there ever since so first thing on a release date is what's its job the archers or the the releases to transfer the archer's intent putting the arrow in the middle of the target as efficiently as possible every single time. So we've got all different kinds of release aids, thumb buttons, clicker buttons, hinges, resistance, index fingers. Um, so we make a lot of different things to make it easier for the archer to do what they wanna do in something that works in their mind. Um, so in each one of these releases, we build in features. And it's we get a lot of uh, questions of people say, hey, why can't you do this? Why can't you do this? And it's, <sighs> It's trying to make something that we can do repeatable over and over and over again. We could make a make a release once, but if we can't do it a thousand times and make them consistent, there's really no point in doing it. Uh, what makes a release aid comfortable? So this is something Eric really worked on whenever he first started with Stan was trying to figure out what makes a release aid fit in your hand perfectly. So he went to, um, he went to a um, uh, occupational therapist, so someone who works with people's hands on a job, like if they have an injury, they go in and get them where they can work with their hands better. So he went and did a study with an occupational therapist um, to figure out what's the best shape of your hand. Like if you're gonna be comfortable, what's the best shape of it? So he came up with five different sizes. And if you look at the releases too, they're not all straight this way but they're angled in. So if you take your hand and kind of just shake it and curl your hand and you look at it, your fingers naturally want to curl down. So that's why we make it where each finger goes down a little bit more because it's that's the natural position you want your hand to be in. And everybody's thumb's a little bit different, so that's why we make the different extension lengths, the different barrel sizes. You want your hand to be in its most natural position as possible to be as consistent every single time. didn't come up. 
So, and then he also went in with the occupational therapist to look at what they see from the smallest hand sizes all the way up to the biggest, and that's where he came up with the five different sizes of releases. So each one can be fit to each individual archer. Shape based on the ergonomic studies. Um, and then we also have the customizable third and fourth finger positions as well. So we, you're able to pivot those up and down. Thumb position, went over that. So again, when you find comfort in something your hand naturally wants to sit in that position, you're going to find more repeatability and more consistency. So when we're designing a release aid, some of the things that go into the design features, not just on the aesthetic side, was speed and timing. So on a thumb button, for instance, the amount of time it takes from when the sear actually breaks to when the D-loop leaves the hook we try to minim minimize that time as much as we can so there's less impact of an archer making a mistake. So, relationship between the trigger mechanism and the sear, so your, your sears that are up in here, how fast those clear one another to let the top part of it come, come undone. Um, said release speed, um, sp speed is king when it comes to how fast can we get that D-loop off the hook so then you can't have any kind of influence on the arrow once you want that release to go. Um, some of the other things we look at is wear and longevity. So Eric really tries to look at if you've got 20 pounds on the hook on the D-loop. He tries to minimize the amount of pressure that's actually on the sears that are coming into contact, the two metal pieces that come into contact. So then you're going to have less drag, less wear, and the releases will last a lot longer, having that minimum as minimal amount of pressure from the D loop on the sears that are sliding against one another as you can. Um, tolerances and moving parts. So, is anybody in here working in manufacturing? Working any machines or anything? Yeah. So, you know, over time the tools wear down. So, it's figuring out how can we make things precise and figuring out how long tools are going to last and figuring out like the different steels, the different aluminums, things like that, how long you can run those machines. So he has to design in his, in his internal mechanism designs where you can have variances here and there and not make it completely catastrophic if something isn't absolutely perfect. Uh, material selection. So we go through a tons of different types of steels trying to find what's going to have the best longevity, the best slickness when it gets hardened so you're not going to have things dragging. So when you're you're pushing the thumb button in, it just nice slides and clicks in, doesn't grind or anything like that. Um, and then for the handles, we have aluminum and we have brass. So you gotta have two different machines because you're gonna have different types of coolants in between each one. So when we're, we're planning out our year for what we're gonna design, we gotta know, okay, brass is gonna be X amount of our sales this year. Aluminum is gonna be this much. So we're gonna set up this machine to do this, this machine to do this, and this machine to do this. Um, surface treatments. So on our Onyx series, we have a, a thing on it called DLC, which is diamond-like coating. So it's a two-stage carbon of graphite and like diamonds. So it's super, super hard and super, super slick. So whenever we're, whenever we're designing what's going to go in the internals, we also have to take into consideration how much time after we machine them to go out and get the coatings done, to get the hardenings done, and then to get back. So once a steel part is done for us, it could be anywhere from three to six weeks before we get that back where we can actually use it. So as we're, as we're looking at timelines, looking at projections of how, what we're going to sell, we have to have that at least six weeks out for the steel. The aluminum stuff's got to be anodized. So you've got a lot of time considerations and figuring out what you're going to build, when you're going to build it, and when you're going to get it back where you can actually use it. Um, and load distribution. So like I was talking about with the leverage points, trying to make sure that everything you do is minimizing the amount of surface wear and pressure that you're going to have on the sears. If anybody has any questions as I'm going along, please feel free to stop me. So, um, said so designing for manufacturable, max, manufacturability and consistency. So that's always a question from Eric. It's, can we do it? Probably. Should we? Probably not because we won't be able to make it consistent. So that's the biggest thing when we're, when we're putting out thousands and thousands of release aids a year, we have to make sure they're consistent. So 
person A is going to get a great release and person B is not going to get a good release. We can't have that happen. So um, again, trade off of what we can make versus what we can do consistently. Um, I've talked about most of that, tool life, material availability, inventory control. So that's another thing we have to deal with too is when we're going to design things, how, how are our suppliers, are we getting steel, aluminum, brass, how quickly can they get us things if we start to see a spike in production? So when we're getting ready to design a new release, what are we looking to do? We're, we don't like putting out things that isn't going to be a, an improvement on what we already have. There's no reason to put out a new release unless it's going to be better than what we're doing already. Um, are there, is there something we're trying to solve? Is there, when we listen to people at shows like this, when they come up and say, hey, I wish you guys could do this, or I love this release, but I wish it could do this. We take all those things into consideration, but it may take a year or two before we get enough things where it's going to be something better than what we're already producing. Some of the things we look at, feel. How does the, how does the release feel in the hand? How does the mechanisms feel? Um, consistency, uh, mechanical timings. So Eric is always working, especially on thumb buttons, because that's kind of his, thumb button is kind of his passion. And trying to make things as fast as possible to decrease that lock time from when the sear trips to when the D loops off the release. Uh, where, um, that's another thing, like I said, we got to make stuff that's going to last years and years and years and years. And buildability. So when Eric designs something, we have a team of assemblers that will sit at the desk and put releases together. We have to make it easy for them to put together again and again and again. We can't make it where it's, you're trying to move a little spring and get something in there. And if they get something wrong, the whole release won't, won't function. We have to make it easy for them to be able to put them together. Yep. Um, about the wear. Um, do you make any, any long-term stress tests for the releases? Uh, Eric has done some studies. That's why we're using some of the DLC coatings and some of the steel that we use. I mean, he's got tables and he's got all kinds of things that he looks at that I don't understand. <laughs> but yeah. Is there, is there any, any amount of, of um, activations you, can, you could share um, where this, these stress tests are uh, going, going to fail? It's... Typically, if you're going to have anything that's going to be on the relationship between the hasp, which is what holds the D-loop, and the stay, that's going to be the most um, most wear on about anything, and it's going to depend on how much weight you're holding. If you're shooting 70, 80 pounds versus shooting 40 pounds, it's going to wear a little bit different. So that, there's no like real, it's going to last this long. So like if you look at my release I have in my pouch, I've had it for 15 years. I've never changed anything on it. And the other question is uh, kind of in-depth, but um, maybe you could answer that. Um, I'm shooting the, the shoot-off right now, mm -hmm. I'm switching to the Onyx, and um, the, the hook is in, in another direction. Mm -hmm. You're talking about um, you, you want to make the, the hook go faster, uh, go off faster. But how is it possible with a hook uh, looking backwards from the, from the loop to go off faster than the hook that is like so it's it's all about it's all about the leverage points and like if you took the the pivot point and where the D loop sits, when it's starting to move up, it's not having to go around the hook. The hook's just going forward, and the the single gated jaw like on your SX3, it's going to be a little bit faster. But we get asked for the the open hook design has been very very popular and that's what people have wanted. So Eric's had to design around that to make sure we clear that D loop and the D loop cast straight off the release even with an open hook design. Yep. Um, so yeah, comfort, customizability is key um, for repeatability. We aren't robots. So we got to make releases that someone can get in their hand and, and get them in there consistently every single time. Um, give and take with internal designs. Can't the whole can we, should we thing to make sure everything is repeatable coming off the machines are the same every single time. So when we're putting them together, Every release we send out is going to be exactly the same. Um, consistency in batch to back products. Um, we have multiple different, I don't even know what they're called, but they're machines that will measure down to tens of thousands of inches of these little parts that we have coming in. So 
every so many runs, I don't know exactly what it is, but they've got a schedule. They'll pull a batch off, put them in the, in the machine, and they'll test all the parts to make sure they're still inside their tolerances. And then we will adjust tool life and when we're changing tools based on what we find on those parts. Um, and then never be satisfied. So one of the, the words we've been using or like the hashtags on Instagram is perfected here. And I'll let Eric, this is another video we did with him. I'll let him kind of go over this when we talked about the perfected here um, moniker. So, questions? A lot of uh, products now are designed with 3D printing. Mm -hmm. Do you see a future for that release? 3D printing, um, I don't know enough about it to be able to answer that question completely. I know we have used some 3D printed models to like look at hand, like if we're gonna make a different shape handle we can 3D print that a lot easier than machining it and, and coming up with that. Um, typically, we would outsource that. We'd send them a, a solid file and they would they would print that out for us because we don't we don't do 3D printing in house. Um, so I can't 100% answer yes or no if 3D printing would be something we could do. Um, but I, I think it would still have to have some kind of machining in it to make sure everything is smooth and exactly precise of where all the holes and everything goes together. Yes. What sort of gains have you achieved in the improving the timing, the speed of the relief? So, um, like, if you look back at the SX3 shootoff platform that you brought before, that release was extremely fast if you were running a fairly light trigger. The heavier you got that trigger, the slower the release from the D-loop came, even when the, the sear tripped. So that's been the biggest thing, is being able to have a range from ultra light to ultra heavy and having the timing stay the same between all of them. That's been the biggest gain. When you were talking before about when you're designing products and you're making sure that the feel is good, um, do you have people who have smaller hands test out the smaller ones? Or is it like you pick, say, the general size and test them? So we will start out with uh, large. That's our number one size. So we'll make up larges and we'll send them to the people that shoot larges. Um, and then once we start getting that handle design done, then we'll start going Usually it's large, medium, extra large, small, double extra large, because that's the way our sales go. So yeah, we do send them out, but we start with large. That's usually the one we start with. I didn't know that start, but Carper stand. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that story. Uh, yeah, it's hard to talk about competition, but if you compare the, the two, what are the strengths of stand compared to um, I said, I think Eric, just his passion for archery. So when he got his degree and he went into the engineering space, I think he was working for an aerospace company and kind of got sick of that and was like, I'm either going to go into one of my two passions, scuba diving or archery. And he ended up picking archery. So the fact that he's actually an archer, a target archer and shoots a lot, I think for him having that passion, knowing what he feels and what he wants and what he feels like other archers are going to want would be one of his very, very good strengths. Um, Jerry, Jerry was a shooter too. So, I mean, I'm sure same thing kind of applies to him as well. Anybody else? <laughs> I would like to thank you on behalf of JVD. I have a little present for you. Thank you. And I will be at the booth if you guys have questions, you are, feel free to come by and talk and whatever. <laughs> Thank you guys.